Unleash the fury. Bang! Unleash the fury, man! Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Hashtag Sports. I am Paul, and that to my immediate right is Ryan. No Mario today. Uh, we joke, the, the running joke on the live stream that we just finished was that Mario was uh, sun uh, sun tanning his uh, five head. Uh, so thank you <laughs> uh, for joining us here. Let's talk the Bills draft. It's been a while. The dust has settled. Uh, it's probably time to go back and really start pulling apart the draft because we covered the draft, Ryan uh rounds one two and three and i think there was some trepidation and frustration right that snuck into the first two days of the draft but on the macro level when you look at the entire draft maybe you'll feel differently once you look at the entire picture uh, because i think we have a tendency because we get into the draft and much like all bills fans do right we want to get into the process of who they take and when they take them and how they took them and who was there instead like i think that's just sort of like the invested fan thing to do is compare against other players that were picked around the same time um because you know players are inherently always tied together right uh, mm -hmm. Just like Worthy and Keon Coleman will always be forever tied together. Just like, you know, Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen are always forever tied together. Um, we're going to have a similar relationship there. But on the macro level, looking at the draft, uh, how did you feel days one and two versus what you felt like once it was all over looking back? Yeah, I mean, I thought, you know, night one was, you know, we, we kind of talked about it all throughout the night, like that that specter of they're going to trade out was mm -hmm. always there. And, you know, the more, you know, as fewer and fewer wide receivers started to go as the night went on, we were yeah. talking about, well, you know, talent's getting pushed down. You know, these guys that are getting drafted are not guys that they necessarily want. You know, tight ends are going and things like that. So, you know, the, the trade out is a possibility. Then the trade occurs where it's Kansas City that comes up, right? And Buffalo's like, what do you, you know, Bills fans, what are you doing? You hear all the guys on WGR going, what are they doing? They're trading out with Kansas City. Listen, if they didn't like Worthy, if they didn't, if they were apathetic about the guys that were there at 28 and you can pick up, you know, additional draft capital, it doesn't matter who it is. Right. Like mm -hmm. your job as Brandon Bean is to say, we're trading out of 28. Our my job is to get the best possible return for that trade out. And if it was Kansas City, it was Kansas City and Kansas City. You know, again, you can make the argument that they would have wound up with worthy at 32. You could have made the argument they would have wound up with worthy at 29 with Baltimore at, you know, any any number of those teams between Buffalo and Kansas City. They could have wound up with worthy. So you get the return. You trade down to 32. You then get the opportunity to trade out, which we had talked all night was what we thought would happen would be Carolina, who mm -hmm. came up to go get Xavier Leggett. And again, if you're deciding that you're good with Coleman, who's there, Leggett was pretty heavily mocked to, to Carolina. Both sides were pretty vocal about wanting to connect with each other. Um, the trade out was fine. Night two, again, I, Coleman was the right pick. I thought that based on what was on the board, I thought that was a good pick. Um I didn't know a lot about Cole Bishop. I know he likes to take guys heads off, but the more I've dug into him, the more mm -hmm. I like the pick more and yep. more. Um, the one that really hung me up and I talked a lot about it on the, on the live stream was the Dwayne Carter pick. I, mm -hmm. I really felt like there were more, more worthy positions to address than defensive tackle in that moment. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I haven't done a good job at this point of digging into Dwayne Carter to find out, you know, productivity wise, um, you know, where he's at. But that really that was the one that hung me up. And that was the one where I probably would have given them a much lower grade then than I will give them now, um, because at that point, it really felt like what what are they doing at wide receiver? Because they haven't done enough at this mm -hmm. point. You know, I yep. thought they were going to come out of the first three rounds with two wide receivers. Uh, they came out with one. And, um, you know, I, I was convinced that they really hadn't done enough at that position to kind of fill what they needed to do. Um, so the first three nights, again, I mean, I think it was a mixed bag. I was good with Coleman. I was good with the trades. I became good throughout the night with Bishop. Um, and then I really feel like I got derailed with the Carter pick because I, I wasn't a fan. I wasn't yeah. in that position. I didn't know the player. I thought there were other, you know, needs on the on the board still. Um, and frankly, I thought that there were other defensive tackles on the board that I was more familiar with. And 
that's all I can do when it comes to breaking down draft profiles, right? Is if I know right. the guy, I'm going to favor the guy. If I don't know the guy, you know, I'm not necessarily going to be a fan night one. Mm-hmm. Well, and uh, what struck me is, I mean, you went nuclear uh, in the last 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you guys did not see it. I'll, I should cut it up and release it as a separate episode because it, it's really great football talk where Mario and Ryan just go at it. And Drew and I, who had been there for four hours at this point, <laughs> we literally just leaned back in our chairs. And it was just, just a war of attrition show. at that point. Yeah, We just watched the show. Um, but you know, I, I, I understand exactly where you're coming from there, right? And, and don't get me wrong. You know, like draft coverage is fun because the preparation for it is really fun. And then you get to see all your hard work and see if it was worth anything, right? Because there may be players that the Bills end up taking. And you're like, man, I didn't spend any time on this guy. Yeah. Like, I just, I just didn't, you know? And one thing that I think we don't have the ability to see is knowing in the back of their mind that they've been talking to Chase Claypool for last month and a half, right? And that they're probably going to, be able to make something happen or that we they know. were down to the final two with OBJ. Right. Point, right. Yeah, like, exactly. That's what I mean. So when those are the things that really signed don't the day know. after the draft was over. So mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. And in, and Buffalo clearly had a type, right? Like if you look at yeah. what's rostered, you have Keon Coleman, who's a big boy, Chase Claypool. Now who's a big boy, Mac Hollins, who's a big boy. Uh, let's see. Justin shorter. Who's a big boy. Mm-hmm. You know, like they've got some big guys on this team. So they clearly have a type that they're going for. Either you're five nine, or you're six four. There, there's a collection of guys in the middle, yeah. but there's just as many guys on this team who are six four as guys who are six three to five ten. Like, yeah. it, then that's crazy to me. But really, when you think about it, big catch radius guys, you know, and uh, it made sense, right? At the macro level, it makes sense. But those are things that that as Bills fans, we get frustrated with, but we don't know all those conversations that are happening in the background. So you got to give yourself some credit every now and again uh, and give yourself some patience every now and again um, because we're just not privy to all those conversations. I'm with you on the Dwayne Carter thing, but the Bills had two defensive tackles on the roster before the draft season started, right? You had Ed Oliver and uh, who is the other one? Uh, Perennial. Uh, Mon Jones. Right, he's no, still on the roster. No, Dequan, Dequan Jones wasn't signed at the time. It oh, was right. him okay. and Eli Anku. That was it. Eli, Eli Anku. Anku. Yeah, they were the only two defensive tackles on the roster. Now you draft Wayne Carter, who again is going to kind of replenish that defensive tackle position. Hopefully, replace Dequan Jones. You know, after this season, I think that's kind of the idea because Buffalo throws a lot of resources at that defensive tackle position. They did two years ago, and I think they realized that was a mistake. Right. They put and, a lot like, of money at defensive tackle. A yeah, lot and like of you money. said, I mean, I was I was um I was ignorant to Dwayne Carter heading into the draft, but like you said, they've got a type, right? There was no reason for us to be ignorant towards what he was. A three time yeah. captain, first yeah. ever three time captain yeah. played at the senior bowl. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. there's reasons to look at this guy and be like, Okay, I get why they drafted him, right? Yeah. Like he's he's the type, he's absolutely prototypical Brandon Bean. Um, Sean McDermott type of guy on defense, um, you know, so there was, there was no reason to that he should have been overlooked, um, mm-hmm. at that, at that spot. So, um, yeah, again, I mean, I understand now why they made the pick, like breaking things down. I understand that, you know, I still think that there probably could have been a better use than a third defensive tackle. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you look at the Quan Jones's age, you know, he's not necessarily a young buck anymore right like he's 32 years old so Mm -hmm. you know how many more miles does he have on his body and he's coming off of you know a pec injury which are you know they're not things that reoccur but it's just it's an it's one of those injuries that just kind of like okay it's another injury to add to the to the list of things that that could go wrong here sure um so they had to get younger at that position yeah and i think we jokingly say it right um we jokingly say it but if you if you're at the senior bowl and you were a captain, Buffalo will draft you. Absolutely. Like you're on their board. And I know it's I know it's almost anecdotal. It's funny to talk about, right? It's I talked to Dan Barello. You you know Barello, right? Yeah, yep. Um, and uh I always like Dan. We have a great conversation. He was writing for a newspaper and he was doing a draft story. So he contacted Mario and I. And during that phone call, there's there's an article out there. I don't have a physical copy of it. Um, but I was like, listen, if you went to the senior bowl. And if you were a captain, Buffalo's interested in you. Like I hate, I hate to put it out there so simply, but they they want character yeah. guys. 
They want accountable guys. And it, the senior bowl is apparently where they do a lot of their heavy lifting, right? Because they, they just have a propensity to do it. They were top three in the last five years of players that went to the senior bowl that got drafted by a team. The bills spend a lot of their picks on senior bowl players. And they spend a lot of their picks on players who are team captains. This is what they do. Um, so yeah, Dwayne Carter makes tons of sense. And so does Ray Davis when you pull back and fit him into that mold. Now, don't get me wrong. I thought there were better running backs on the board. Yeah. I know people are going to love the story of Ray Davis, and I completely understand why. But again, Buffalo has a type. They love running backs who are under six foot. They just love running backs who are almost 220 and under six foot. That is that it they prefer him to be under 5'10. <laughs> right. Like Ray yeah. Davis is five foot eight, 211 pounds, you know, like that's his profile. And that's the type of player that they gravitate towards. The age concerns me. Right. But if you're the bills, you turn and burn running backs as it is. So what do you care if he's 24 years old at this point? Yeah. And, and he's, they clearly were looking for a specific type of running back. Yeah. Right. He's got, he's, he's played, he played five years in college. Mm-hmm. He had two fumbles mm-hmm. in his entire That's career. Big deal for Buffalo. He also he also led Kentucky with seven receiving touchdowns last season, mm-hmm. averaged nine point eight yards per reception. They were looking for a guy who they can trust in big moments to mm-hmm. take care of the football yep. and will catch a ball that's thrown his way, right? Like and he ran a four five two, so he's not necessarily a slow back at all. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he's he's the kind of guy that they want opposite James Cook Mm -hmm. and he's a guy truthfully as we talk about the fantasy stuff that we're trying to get stood up here on on hashtag he's a guy that I'm I'm worried about what James Cook's fantasy value is because Ray Davis is absolutely a three down profile of a running back and when you take him you take Frank Gore Jr. you take Ty Johnson you worry about what does Cook's role look like Mm -hmm. this year because they're going to eat into those carries. I don't, I still think he's going to wind up being the primary back. And I say that meaning he's going to out snap everybody else, but in terms of attempts, I think it's going to be a very much a different situation than what we've seen that what we saw last year with James cook for the Buffalo bills. They did a lot at the running back position without really doing a whole lot of flashy moves. They did a lot to shore up that room and make it a very difficult uh, fantasy production uh, road for James cook. Well, and James Cook, problem keeping the football safe, right? Yep. Ray Davis, polar opposite there. Um, but now there are very good interior runners. Like right. Ray Davis is not a very, he doesn't have great vision on the inside. He's just not a good interior runner, but I don't think you're really asking him to be one. Um, the Frank, Bills well, do, Frank Gore Jr. is a pretty good interior runner. Yeah, right. Exactly. So you got Ty Johnson, who's a single cut back, right? He, he runs on the inside very well. Frank Gore Jr., same thing. So, you know, you've got a stable of four backs there who can complement each other, which again is, I think, something that's very different than what we've seen before. You had Devin Singletary and Zach Moss, who you arguably say, I can't tell the difference between these two guys, right? Like that, I think that was one of the problems when they drafted Zach Moss, you looked at it, you're like, well, what the hell are we doing? Right. We just, there's, this isn't an Aaron Jones, AJ Dillon, where you were drafting a power back, right? For short yarded situations, regardless of what you think of AJ Dillon, that was the reason that he got drafted. And that's pretty common. Uh, where you see teams try and build a stable of backs that all complement each other. Um, Buffalo went out and got Ray Davis, and he's very similar to James Cook, right? Just a little bit more ball security. Well, I shouldn't say a little bit more, significantly more ball security. Yeah, there, there right? was a there was a clear straw that broke the camel's back situation with that dropped touchdown against oh, Kansas yeah. City. Yeah, and that that seemed as though that was kind of like the last straw for mm-hmm. James Cook can be a primary back in the NFL for the Buffalo Bills, mm-hmm. right? Like he had put the he put the ball on the turf a couple times this season in key moments. Mm-hmm. He had that drop touchdown. He wasn't develop. He didn't develop all season as a pass protector. No, um, you know, so it really was kind of telling of he's a good change of pace back, but we need to find someone who's going to emerge as a workhorse and that's where Ray Davis comes in. He's absolutely workhorse type material. Um, And then it's okay. Well, do we trust cook to hold on to the football in short yarded situations? Because if the answer is no, then now we have to go address that. And that's the Frank, Frank or junior Ty Johnson's back. Like again, they did a a lot that I think bills fans may not appreciate uh, the way they should. Um, 
to signal that that James Cook is on a very short leash this season, if he's on a leash at all. I mean, again, it may just be a timeshare right out of the gate, depending on how Ray Davis steps in. But yeah. a guy of his age, a guy with his mileage on it, they can't necessarily afford to let him sit for a year, right? Mm-hmm. Like Ray Davis is probably going to be a guy that gets carries day one. And that's yeah. a big, uh, that, that, that's pretty telling for a team that invested uh, a high pick on James Cook not two seasons ago. Right. Cole Bishop getting off the bus as a starter, right? Just go yeah. back. We we very briefly to- spoke about Cole Bishop. You only had mentioned him. Yeah. Uh, we talked about Keon Coleman uh, in the live stream. So we'll hold. If you want to see our thoughts on Keon Coleman, you can go ahead and, and look at that. Uh, the the episode that we just did, the live stream that we just did. Uh, what would that be? Sunday night, uh, the 5th. Uh, but I, one thing I didn't mention about Keon Coleman um, that I think is really important to talk about is uh, when you talk about what that type of player brings to this offense, right? I think it's the alpha mentality that Diggs had, right? Um, and you look at what's here in the room, and I think you need another guy to step up and be like, no, no just throw me the ball. Just throw it over there. I'll go get it. Yeah. Right. That was yeah. the sort of the safety blanket that you had with Gabe Davis for a brief period of time. And I don't know what exactly happened there uh, for that to deteriorate over two seasons the way that it did. Um, but there were times where Gabe Davis dominated games just because it was like, listen, just throw it over there. I'll go get it. It's fine. Okay. Uh, on the sideline, he was automatic. And then yep. the last two seasons, that was just gone. Um, Keon Coleman's a kid that's going to absolutely love contact in the NFL. So I really look forward to that. But Cole Bishop, we haven't talked about at all. Yep. So it, when the Bills drafted Cole Bishop, everybody's saying, oh, this, you know, everybody remembers the hit, right? Like there's the one, right? Yep. Um, you fell in love with Cole Bishop over the course of as more things were coming out in the draft about him. Yep. So tell me what you mean when you say that. But first, I want to preface this. Let's not forget the Bills drafted a tight end from Utah who had a little bit to say about Cole Bishop along the way. And Cole Bishop had a little bit to say about you know, uh, a current Bills player. Do you think stuff like that really matters when it comes to drafting players, especially teams that try to dig into character as much as the Bills do? Yeah, I I think it's, I think a lot of it speaks volumes uh, as to, you know, when, when they're looking at a guy and and it's kind of like, Hey, all things equal, right? Like we know someone who knows this guy. So let's go ask him. And I, I definitely think that they had conversations with Dalton Kincaid. He played with Cole Bishop by all accounts. They lined up next, you know, covering Bishop covered Kincaid regularly in practice. Um, you know, they went back to back Rose Bowls together. Like that doesn't happen on accident. Uh, the thing for for me, the more and more I heard about Cole Bishop, the more and more I was like, oh, so he's just going to be Jordan Poyer, right? Mm-hmm. He's going to be Jordan Poyer's role, right? Like he blitzes really well. He played a lot at at safety, but he also played a lot at nickel linebacker, which mm-hmm. again, that's Jordan Poyer. He runs a four five. He he blitzes really well. He covers really well. He led the he led the team in tackles the last two seasons. Like these things don't happen on accident. Again, at Pac twelve, it's a you know it's a high flying, usually pretty good defense for the most part uh, in most games at least. Um, but he had you know third down stops nine and a half third down stops slash last season, two interceptions, two fumble recoveries, you know, second team, all pack 12. The more I hear about him, senior bowl, right. Captain, like the more you hear about him, the more it's like, okay, so I see where he's going to fit in, in this, in this Sean McDermott defense. And I think one of the reasons we've been able, we can be more encouraged about that than the offensive guys, because we know what this defense is going to look like, right? Like we know they may go to three linebackers, but we've seen him play with three linebackers before Sean McDermott. Right maybe he goes three safeties. We've seen that before, right? Like, so I can see where he fits in in a Sean McDermott defense. And and again, Bobby, you know, Babich is going to run the defense quote unquote, but let's not get it twisted. This is going to be yeah. Sean McDermott's defense, right? Yeah. Like it has been since he got the Buffalo. Yeah. Um, and I can see where he fits in. And I think he's going to be a really good fit in that particular role. Um, mm-hmm. It'll just be interesting to see if it's rap or if it's Edwards at that free safety position. But Cole Bishop, I think is going to be off the bus day one starter at that strong safety. You know, they don't really call them strong safeties anymore, but it's that you know, that in the box safety 
nickel linebacker type of type of role. Um, he's going to fit in really nicely, I think, in this defense, and they're going to use him in a lot of different ways as they did Jordan Boyer. Mm-hmm. You got to keep moving on. You really like the Cedric Van Cedric Van Pran Granger pick. Uh, and listen, when in doubt, draft a big boy from Georgia, right? It's like th- they make big boys. That offensive line is typically amongst the biggest in the NFL. Yep. I'm sorry, in college football. They generate a ton of NFL talent um, because Georgia is a team that loves to run the football. Right. Like, and they just get big, nasty lines, like drafting linemen from Wisconsin. They just, they're big, mean country boys. And uh, Cedric Van Pran Granger, that one's, he's going to need a nickname. Um, VPG. VPG. Already got it. Yeah. He's, yeah. We need, we need that nickname. Um, again, you, you pull back the layers and you say, I get it. Right. You, you let go of Mitch Morris because you, you needed the cap space. Let's just be honest. Right. And he had spent his time in Buffalo and, and his usefulness had reached its end. You got to refresh at that position. Um, you Dake. This was a day two guy all the way. Most centers typically are, you rarely, rarely see centers drafted, uh, in, in the top 20 in NFL drafts. So seeing one at any point is, is a pretty tall statement to who that player is. But after you get outside the first round, man, they, they fall. They are fourth and fifth round players because often centers are not players that they're usually a little undersized and you struggle to put them at other positions. Um, tell me a little and bit. You only about, need one, right? Like you only need that's one. That's right. Yeah, so. that's right. That's right. Like you'd never ask Reed to snap for your offense, right? Because it's right. a different style of player. Like even though Reed is a, a great long snapper, it's just a different style of player. He's literally physically built different than what you would ask for a standard NFL center. And there's a lot of relationship building that goes into that with the quarterback. I mean, there's a reason, yeah. you know, there's, there's 32 starting centers in the NFL. Mm-hmm. So these guys do tend to fall. Um, you know, I think a couple of things that, that really, you know, two, two team, two time team captain, right back to there back it is years, again. team captain. There so it is in, again. in insert, you know, insert that, um, I think the, the the one thing he he's got 44 consecutive starts in college. He was all first team all SEC last year, along with second team All American. Like mm-hmm. again, the, there's only one center that makes that team, and he was you know essentially you know builds him as the second best center in college in 2023. Mm-hmm. Um, all second team all S, all SEC in 2022. Um, and then in 2023, he won the Jacobs blocking, blocking trophy, trophy, which yeah. was, yeah, which was the best conference, the best blocker, best lineman in the SEC. So this is a guy who's he he's really good at what he does. He's not injured. He's consistent in starts. He's, you know, again, 44 consecutive big, you know, he's, you know, six four two ninety eight, which is big for a center. Um, but he he's played center, right? He's played center his entire career, knows how to do it. And he was a two-time team captain. So he's he's prototypical Brandon Bean, Sean McDermott. I think he's going to fit in really well. And again, we talked about it during the live. I think he's probably the contingency if McGovern doesn't work out or if David Edwards doesn't work out and they decide to move McGovern back to guard, they've That's got right. a guy that they feel like they feel strongly they can slide in there. So yeah, he's, he's like- the contingency behind Mc- McGovern. Again, whether they decide to McGovern's not working or Edwards isn't working, let's get McGovern back into where he was last year and really good at it, and we'll just slide VPG into that situation. Right. Well, and again, a player that you could even slide to your practice squad because sure. centers, you're not going to, teams are not going to roster multiple centers. They're, right. They just, they're not going to do it. Um, so that's why you're absolutely right. Most teams don't carry more than one center. You have players who can also play center is how that goes, right? Like you go back in the way back machine for John Feliciano, you know, like uh, Ryan Bates, uh, the the guys who can do it. If you have to have them do it. Um, it, Listen, is NFL comp by Lance Zerline was Lloyd Cushenberry. And if he turns into Lloyd Cushenberry, I'm fine with that. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I'm I'm fine with that. that. Absolutely fine with that. All right. So, Taking a look at the rest of the draft. Listen, you know me, Ryan. Washington is always my little hidden yeah. gem of a team. I love watch watching Washington football. They're just always really well coached on the de- defensive side of the football. They typically have corners drafted every year that are that are you know impact players. Marcus Peters was 
you know, was a Washington corner. Like they, they come out every year, but this year was different. They had multiple wide receivers, a quarterback taken in the first round, uh, left-handed quarterback. If I'm remembering correctly, left-handed quarterback drafted is, is Pax left-handed. Uh, he might be. Yeah, he might be. Mm-hmm. Oh no, 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 no. He's not. He's not. He's right-handed. Um, but typically you see again, corners are kind of where they make their money. Buffalo goes and grabs a very heady linebacker out of Washington, and I'm not going to pronounce this name. So have fun, Ryan. Y- Eula Fashio. I think I nailed it. Yeah, I think that's right. <laughs> you told me phonetically how to say it, and uh, and I wasn't going to take the first bullet on the, on this episode, so that I wasn't going to do that. Um, one thing I will say about Washington is they're always very disciplined as a college when it comes to playing defense. And when you draft a Washington player, you're going to get a very disciplined player. I think sometimes because again, of the conference that they play in, they usually are limited athletically, but I don't think you can say that about this kid. Um, like one of the best linebacker 40 times. And again, I don't think you could judge a linebacker based off 40 times, right? Because film is film is the king of everything. Um, it does he play like a four or five linebacker. I don't really think so, but this is where you got Milano, right? This is where you can yeah. find value and Buffalo is not afraid to do that. This is also a kid that was red shirted in 2018, 2018. He red shirted. He got drafted 2024. Ryan, that's crazy. <laughs> that's yeah. crazy. He's a, I mean, he's a, he's a pre-med student like he's he's mm-hmm. he's going to probably when his football career is over he's going to be a doctor like hopefully he's... not a surgeon your hands like <laughs> ogre mcfarlane <laughs> but he's the a worst you know, proctologist again, a... ever booger mcfarlane would be the worst proctologist yeah yeah oh my god yeah but he's you know again a team captain right there like again he was a preferred walk-on initially but then you know got a scholarship back he had a bicep ACL injuries, mm. but then he had, you know, full, full first team, all pack 12 last season, uh, 94 tackles. And I mean, the, his, the biggest stat to me, and we talked a little bit about this before the stream started was last season, he had 326 coverage snaps and he didn't allow a touchdown. So when you think about that in terms of tight ends, you know, or I'm sorry, linebackers, he was, he was, you know, covering tight ends, potentially slot receivers, running backs in the red zone, you know, 326 coverage snaps and didn't allow a single touchdown. So yeah, I, mean, I think huge again, when you look at these defensive players, it's like, I get where he slides in potentially to a McDermott defense, right? Like mm-hmm. may, he may be that third down goal line linebacker, extra linebacker that comes on the field, frees up Matt Milano to come blitz because they don't need him in coverage, which where's he, he's been very good over his NFL career. But maybe this kid frees him up to do what he does really well, which is rush the passer, passer and just be instinctual out, out on the field. And we'll let the kid go guard Travis Kelsey, or we'll let the kid go worry about um, Br- Brees Hall out of the backfield so Matt Milano doesn't need to do it. We can bring an extra body in the blitz. Um, I can see where he fits in on this defense. And I think he's going to be an impact player season one because – Let's be honest. I mean, like, who who else do they have at the t- at the linebacker position yeah, behind exactly what right. probably will be their starting three, which is Matt Milano, AJ Terrell, or I'm sorry, Terrell Bernard, um, and um, I forget the other Nick Morrow. Like, those are probably like the first three linebackers. But yeah, I can see this kid absolutely contributing over like a Dorian Williams, um, over a Deion Jones, over a Balen Specter, just because mm-hmm. of how he's put together and how productive he can be. Right. Well, and Buffalo's got absolutely no allegiance to Deion Jones or Bail Inspector at this point. Nope. Bail Inspector's nope. entering uh, year four, I think. Is this his fourth year? He came in with Bernard, right? So the year three. Yeah. This will be year three. Be his, he was drafted in 2022. So yeah. Yeah. Um, and Dorian Williams, all the talent in the world, but still again, a project. Still a project. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And drafted two rounds earlier than this kid. So yeah. And yep. that, but that's what athleticism will do, right? And need. I think Buffalo. I go back to the Dorian Williams pick and I just say, Hey, man, this is why some, you have to avoid drafting for need, you know, like mm-hmm. they, they knew they needed help there. I just, they just kind of jumped the shark a little bit. It's, it is what it is. Um, uh, Javon Solomon, uh, we talked about on the live stream. So again, I'll leave a card in this episode to go back. So you can all take a look at that. Uh, great player from Troy, uh, was led FBS in sacks with 16 and was 
sixth in tackles for loss last season. Uh, again, a player that most national media is never going to talk about because he plays at Troy. That's yep, exactly that's ex- just what it is. Um, but Ryan, it's very nice things to say, uh, to say about uh, Javon Sullivan. So go check out the live stream for that. Tylen Gramble. I just don't even think this kid's going to make the team. It's I yeah. get you. I get you throw the dart at the tackle. Right. Yep. Like it's sixth round. This is where you start throwing darts at, at tackles and corners. This is what Buffalo does every year. They throw darts at tackles and corners and rounds five, six and seven. This is what they're going to do. I am not in love with the Gramble pick. Uh, it's just a tackle to me that I don't think is going to make the roster. Um, I, I wasn't in love with the pick. Yeah, I mean, you know, he played four years at Jackson State before he transferred over to UCF. Um, you know, he started both seasons at UCF. So, you know, there's something to be said for that. Honorable mention, all Big 12 last year. Uh, really high RAS score. Like, you know, we've, that's what we've it is. Before about loves the RAS. The RAS he's, score. he's a 9.85 yeah. uh, on the RAS. So that's, you know, huge. That's pretty close to, I think, what um, Spencer Brown Spencer was. Brown. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but he's just been a kid who hasn't been able to stay healthy. Um, he's, you know, he, he started as a tight end, then he initially switched over to left tackle. Mm-hmm. Um, again, four years at Jacksonville State. So I don't anticipate him making the roster. I see why they took the dart throw on him because you do have to replace potentially Spencer Brown, re sign or replace next year. So why not? You know, maybe we can sneak this kid through the practice squad, give him a year, see if we like him, you know. Right that kind of thing but yeah i don't i don't know he's not as limiting as spencer brown spencer brown is very limiting as a player because you only be able to play him at right tackle right uh tylen gramble will allow you to play at guard because six six he's i mean he'll he'll bulk out at 325 this year probably he came in i think at like 310 close to 310 so odds are buffalo will probably get him 325 if they're looking to play him on the interior um, which maybe that's what they plan to do right like just Mm -hmm. because he played left tackle that that doesn't mean that that's where you stay. Um, but he could profile on the interior, but does give you a contingency plan for um, Spencer Brown. Uh, but again, I, I really just don't see this kid making the team. Maybe he makes it through waivers. But, but I, I mean, he he's going to fit a stretch zone concept, right? So when you talk about running zone concepts, he's got the lateral mobility to be competitive in that type of offense, which is what I would imagine Aaron Cromer is going to love to do is, you know, bring a player like him out and get him in space. That's great. With that being said, I, I just don't know if there's enough flexibility across the offensive line to be able to roster him. Yep. Uh, then that gets us to Daquan Hardy corner out of Penn state. Uh, Daquan Hardy, former team captain. Is this another former team captain, Ryan? Uh, Daquan Hardy is a return guy. That's what he was known for at Penn State. He's the one. He had two t- two, two run back against UMass mm-hmm. um, this past season. Uh, full-time punt returner, averaged 14.6 yards per return. Um, first player in school history to score multiple punt return touchdowns in the same game. So I, he's a, probably a guy that they're looking to um, probably bring in and, and hope maybe he can compete for that that corner that becomes a special teams ace type of situation ran a four, three, nine at the combine blazing that's crazy. Speed. Yeah. That's um, crazy. So he's probably a guy again, you know, he played with Joey Porter jr. Um, during seven on seven. So, I mean, he's got, you know, connections, but again, I think he's probably a guy that they bring in similar to, you know, maybe like a Saran Neal where it's like, okay, we're going to bring him in. Can he be a, uh, a special teams contributor and, you know, sixth corner, on the depth chart or something along those lines, but um, he's got an uphill battle. Uh, Five probably. nine in the NFL is tough yeah. at yeah, the quarterback is, position. That's that's real tough unless you're unless you're playing in the slot. And even then, like that's not that used to be where you put your undersized corners was against right. the slot not guys. Anymore. Right. Not anymore. No, you got slot receivers at six three, six yeah, four. And I think with the injury you know? with the injury history that the Bills have had in the secondary, I think he's got that working against him. Yeah. Right, because they've they've the one position where they've experienced a lot of injuries has been in the secondary over the right. last few seasons. And I don't yeah. know that they're gonna find I don't know that they're gonna be able to talk themselves into risking having to put Tylen Gra- Grable out on the field mm-hmm. at any point <laughs> and, right. and 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 you know guard against these wide receivers. So he's got an uphill battle and maybe another guy that sneaks through to the practice squad, or maybe another guy that New England grabs and converts into a safety and starts. <laughs> Stop it with that. <laughs> 
the last pick was uh, Travis Clayton from the International Player Pathway Program, an offensive tackle. That's a very broad term here um, from England, not New but, England, but he, just England. He, he profiles as a tackle. <laughs> he does profile as a tackle. Um, and also probably a very good punter uh, if you need that, like an emergency punter. Uh he played or, a kick, or a kick returner or, or a kick. Re- oh God. Can you imagine? We talked about pounds. that in the live. Yeah. yeah. I mean, six, six, seven, 300 pounds. He plays rugby with yeah. these new kickoff rules. Who knows what they, what they may get up there, you know, have up their sleeve here in Buffalo. Can you imagine them doing that in practice? Like just oh. hey, okay, let's, let's just see what it looks like guys. Did you imagine them doing it in a preseason game just to try it out? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's. I don't. I think the NFL would frown on that. I think the NFL. Roger Goodell would be on the phone, being like, "What are you guys doing? You're making." You think so? I think Roger Goodell would absolutely love to see one of his international pathway players having meaningful impact on making a mockery, making a mockery of the new kickoff rule. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Yeah. Yeah. The Steelers are going to throw Justin Fields out there to return kicks. Why not? Right. Uh, I mean, crazy. Yeah. I mean. It's it's I was watching the the UFL today. So I was, you know, that's where that new kickoff rule came from yeah. was that the XFL um it, it's it's every return had potential for a big a big return a big return and you yeah. don't see you did haven't seen that in the NFL years in 5 years. 5 6 years maybe yeah. like where every time somebody fielded the ball it's like this could go to the house. And I think that's mm-hmm. what the NFL wants to bring back now. Right. You know, again, is it, you know, we, tongue in cheek, is it a six, seven, 300 pound guy who runs a sub five forty? Like, you know, I don't know, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> or maybe that's getting a little extreme. Maybe we're a couple years away from that, but right. Um, you know, it, it, it makes an easier path for these rugby players. I think with the new kickoff rules, if it winds up sticking, then we've had, probably in the last decade that they've been trying this pathway program. Right. Well, and normally the pathway program, those players aren't part of the standard draft. There's usually a separate draft for pathway player program uh, eligible participants where they're eligible for the draft, but none of them ever get drafted. Um, And then they go to a supplemental draft. And the way that works is only certain teams are eligible to draft those players. Uh, once you go through the NFL draft process. So Buffalo doing something very interesting here. Yeah. Um, but again, uh, guys never played a down of football, but 300 pounds at a sub five, that could be fun. <laughs> go right? catch the ball and just run. I mean, he's done that his entire big rugby man touchdowns. Life, so. You know, yeah. Buffalo loves their big man touchdowns. They do. Yeah. Is this the new Reggie Gilliam? <laughs> <laughs> I challenge you, Ryan. I challenge you. They're saying he's an offensive tackle, but maybe maybe he's not. I, I yeah. I mean, I I don't know. It's you. You always wonder, right? Like with when you start digging into what these new rules look like, what this guy does, it has done in his in his past history. I mean, maybe they're thinking defensive ta- or offensive tackle because again, rugby they do you know block and they do push piles and that kind of stuff, but. They also catch the ball and and run north and south, and you know they yeah. they just run through people. And mm-hmm. uh, it, it'll be it'll be interesting to see as camp breaks and we start getting into like what is this kid actually going to do? What is he good right. at? Right. Let's see. Can't be any worse at catching the ball as James Cook. So nope, that's for sure. <laughs> that's for sure. Pretty sure he doesn't make that cut to the corner of the end zone, though. Not not <laughs> trying to downplay. Pretty confident. He's not. A, he's not a one 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 cut. Guy, you don't think? <laughs> but the term shake and bake to Travis Clayton means an awful difference. <laughs> it means it's not the same. It's not the same. Uh, all right, Ryan. So that's the entire 2024 NFL draft for the Buffalo Bills. Uh, again, walking away on the macro level, looking at everything. I really feel differently than I did the first the first three rounds. I felt very underwhelmed because you had a world of possibilities as the draft was imploding in the top 15 picks. Um, I thought there was a real opportunity for Buffalo to grab any player they wanted, right? Like thought they had the ammunition. They decide to stock up for next year, which again, I understand, right? I get what they're doing. The bean loves assets. Maybe he didn't love this draft class, uh, in respect to have to go get value or go get the player that he really was, you know, had to have. Maybe there was no had to have player here. 
Um, but this is finally a time where Buffalo is going to have to roster most of these players. Like the day is coming and it's probably here where you're not going to see them, you know, keep and roster a, a Mac Hollins where they paid him $3 million, where before it was like, well, they paid him $3 million. Yeah, he'll probably make the team right where they would, what they would put AJ Klein on their roster for $4 million, right? Like this isn't the same roster building that you're going to see. I wouldn't imagine uh, walking into 2024, you have to roster these players. Cap rolls over. You got to figure out a way to generate some inexpensive players for next season. It's not really about this season. Yeah, you're, right you're now back into developmental season. mode if yeah. you're the Bills coaching staff. You've got to go yeah. back to developing some of these younger players. You ha- you've gotten away from that over the last couple of seasons because you've been able to go out and get Von Millers and go out and get Connor McGoverns and David Edwards, like these guys that are, you know, they're they're guys that have played in the NFL. And you can go yeah. get them, you can pay them, you can bring them in, and you can supplement your holes that way. And now you've got Josh Allen you've got to pay. Now you've got you know, Matt Milano, whose contract kicks in and you've got these guys that you have to, you, Spencer Brown has to get paid. Deion Dawkins just got paid. Like the list goes on and on. Teron Johnson just got paid. Like, and you've got to figure out what you're doing at corner next season. So they're in this mode where now they have to start developing some of these young guys because next year they're going to have another crop of rookies that come in that are going to have to contribute. And you can't be coaching up two classes of rookies at the same time. No. So some of these kids are going to have to grow up quick this season for the Buffalo Bills. Um, we're going to see. Uh, we're going to see if they can develop players like they have in the past. There's no reason to think they can't because they've done it in the past. So I think what you're to your point, Paul, I, I get what they're trying to do. Um, I get why they're doing some of these things, but it doesn't mean that me as a Bills fan doesn't mean I have to like it, right? right. Like, it doesn't Not- mean I have to like the fact that they're all signs are pointing to them essentially punting this season to be, we're just going to go as far as, you know, Josh Allen can throw us on his back and and carry us and maybe we can steal a couple games because the last three seasons we've been we're good enough to go win a Super Bowl let's go do it and this year I, I don't think they feel like they're good enough to go win a Super Bowl unless Josh Allen's going to go Superman for 17 games plus the playoffs and they're going to have some some things break their way uh, as the season winds down well and I think there's probably another episode here right because you you talked about the ghost of Matt Milano and we're talking about a player walking into his age was Milano's birthdays in July is his 30 season his age mm-hmm. third Matt Milano's 30 this year folks um so 30 and a couple of the injuries later not the right side of 30 you know like there's no good side of 30 when you've had two knee injuries in your 20s like that's just there, there's a there's a lot to unpack there um yep. all right but let's wrap it up i'm paul from hashtag that is ryan thank you so much ryan for joining me uh in while mario is again sunbathing his five head <laughs> i think that's a great that's a great term that's a great yes, term I enjoy are, you that. gonna, are you gonna sell that picture behind you with mcdermott still staring at you you know if someone wants to make an offer <laughs> it does they trust the process it is signed by sean mcdermott so if anyone is is looking for some memorabilia, let me know. I also have a Stefan Diggs helmet that I may be willing to oh, part with at this point uh, yeah. in his career. And uh, that my, the, the numbers are dwindling. I have a picture to the right that you can't see, but it is uh, signed by all four players on the picture. But it is Josh Allen, Tremaine Edmonds, Ooh. Stephon Diggs, Ooh. and Trey White. All oh, in one, man. all signed by all four players. Oh, Value plummeting as the, as <laughs> the, the seconds tick by. <laughs> I'm sure that was really cool to have. And like, it was awesome when I got it. <laughs> yeah, it was awesome when I got it. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, that's the way side memorabilia goes. It's great for, for a bit, and then it, then yeah. it's worthless for a yep, while. Exactly, and and then it then ten years, and then the they'll right, all then retire, and it'll be worth something again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what happens. So you just got to now you're just in a holding pattern. At least it's signed by Josh, right? Like yes. that's that's what that you're holding keep, on to. It will keep its value quite high for quite some time. So yeah, well, unless he Cam Newton's himself, which yeah, two two of the four guys are probably Hall of Famers. One guy could be if he keeps up his career the way he's going. We'll see. I think that's another topic for another another show. That's a debate for another day. (laughs) All right. Thanks again for joining. Hashtag sports. Have a great one, everybody.